So, einen wunderschönen guten Abend. I know I pass on to English in a few seconds, but let me allow you a very warm and German herzlich willkommen hier bei uns im House of Switzerland zu einem für uns ganz, ganz spannenden Panel heute Abend. Ich begrüße ganz herzlich auch das Publikum online und ähm, möchte mich Ihnen vorstellen. Mein Name ist Britta thiele Klaproth. Ich gehöre zusammen mit meinen Kollegen hier zu denjenigen, die dieses Projekt für Sie realisiert haben, also dieses House of Switzerland. Ich glaube, einige, ähm, ich habe ein paar bekannte Gesichter gesehen und ähm, auch einige neue. Wir wollen mit dem House of Switzerland hier in Stuttgart ein, ähm, einen Platz für Begegnungen schaffen und wollen Baden-Württemberg und die Schweiz, die in vielerlei Bereichen so eng verbunden sind, einfach durch den innovativen Ansatz noch näher ähm, und gemeinsam voranbringen. Das heißt, wir wollen Baden-Württemberg stärken und wir wollen die Schweiz stärken und ähm, die Erfahrung der letzten Drei Monate, wir sind jetzt hier auf der Zielgeraden, gibt uns recht und sagt, ähm, das, war ein, das war ein großer Erfolg. Wir haben hier verschiedene Technologieabende kuratiert, ähm, von künstlicher Intelligenz zu Smart City, zu personalisierter Gesundheit und heute Abend geht es um Drohnen. Und bevor ich an Anja Lange ähm, übergebe, ähm, die den Abend für uns heute moderiert, möchte ich Ihnen ganz kurz sagen, dass für mich nicht als, ähm, als Wissenschaftlerin, sondern dass ich Baden-Württemberg und die Schweiz im Bereich von Drohnen als hochgradig spannend wahrnehme. Ähm, wir haben Experten hier, ähm, die vor allem zur Regulierung was sagen können. And um, yeah, I'm looking very much forward to the very interesting and highly experienced high-level discussion tonight and pass on the mic to Anja. Thank you for being here. Well, th thank you so much, Britta. So this evening is going to be in English, so I'm just going to say a quick guten Abend für alle Deutschen <laughs> and otherwise uh, welcome here in the House of Switzerland. Welcome to this panel. My name is Anja Lange and I'm a moderator here from Stuttgart, Germany and I've been to the House of Switzerland now in the last couple of months quite a lot. Uh, they have to fill up the Swiss wine, you know, because of me. No. Um, so in the next one and a half hours, we're going to focus on the future of aerial robotics. Very, very um, interesting topic, as Britta already said. And I've heard that many aviation experts, they are promising or saying that this, the 20s, yeah, this decade is going to be the next golden age of aviation and of uh, flight. Let's see, this is exactly what we're going to talk about. If it is really like this, technologies are definitely evolving. Also, we're going to find out more about this. And it seems like this, this future where everything's about drones and drone power is not so far anymore. But let's see about this. For this, we have some really amazing experts from Switzerland, from Germany here with us. So first, we're going to listen to two short presentations from two professors who are going to show their research. And that is fa uh, followed by a panel discussion. So I'm going to invite all the experts here and we're really going to discuss this future. Obviously, I would like you to ask questions as well. So please use this opportunity. We do have a microphone here and ask all the questions that you're interested in. The same counts for our uh, online audience, so a very warm welcome to you as well. I already heard that we have quite a lot of people that are watching us online as well. So if you have any questions and you're watching it on YouTube or Instagram, please just comment in the little comment section if you have questions and I will also ask them here on stage. This is how hybrid events work, it's great. And if we then still have questions and still more interest in the topic, then we invite you over to our, well, food and drink corner for a nice glass of Swiss wine and some cheese uh, to discuss the topic further. And now let me welcome from Lausanne, Professor Dario Floriano. He is the director of the Laboratory of Intelligent Systems at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne and the EPFL. He is also the founding director of the Swiss National Center of Competence in Robotics. Um, it's a research program that brings together all the different labs across Switzerland. And he already helped spinning off two startups, two companies, um, 
that are you know really involved in the in the drone business and his research is really going into the biological inspired robotics it's really really interesting he's going to show us a lot about this and about his research and i'm actually really excited i don't haven't seen the presentation yet so i'm really excited please um with a very warm applause welcome professor florian uh, dario floriano <laughs> welcome <laughs> Does it work? Okay, very great, thank you. Uh, great, thank you for joining us today and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. So today I will be uh, speaking about um, the science, the technology and the future of drones in the next 10 minutes. And what you see here is a, um, an artistic rendering of uh, the goal of, our, of my lab. Um, and uh, what you see here is lots of drones. They are bio-inspired, as Anya was saying. And uh, most importantly, they are capable of flying in, in environments that we share with them. So they must be able to uh, avoid obstacles or at least to be resilient to obstacle avoidance. They must be safe for humans to operate, both in terms of how you use them and what happens if they go out of control or they get in touch with, with humans. And so what I do actually is not that I do not mimic uh, biology, I just try to capture principles from biology and translate them uh, into engineering um, uh, solutions. I'm going to show now to you a couple of examples of how we started from a research question in biology or taking inspiration from biology, and we turn that into a research result and eventually into a company. I will then uh, tell you something about our current research, which could become the future of, of drones, possibly. A lot of, actually, all the stuff I'm going to show to you today has been done by my researchers, PhD students and postdocs, who are really great. So you see my name there, but there should be <laughs> lots of other names. Uh, just I didn't have space to put all of them. So let me start uh, with one uh, early research question we had at that time, that was back in 2009, 2010, I was interested in replicating the amazing capabilities of insect eyes. Insect eyes are amazing because they have almost 360 degree field of view and they are super lightweight and they are super soft. They cover their brain. When an insect collides with an object, uh, essentially they hit the object with the brain. Uh, with, the, with the eyes, and they deform and they still function. And so at that time, I uh, was fortunate to have a team of researchers across Europe, including the Fraunhofer Institute here in, in Germany, in Jena. And um, uh, our goal was to reproduce these, make an artificial compound eye. And what you see here in this slide is, is, uh, is what, we, uh, what we obtained is a cylindrical compound eye. You say, well, uh, it's larger than the insect eye, it's, uh, yes, it's true, it's larger. It's cylindrical, so it's not exactly spherical as an insect eye, but the advantage is that it can be 100 times faster than an insect eye because we use electronic speed to process the signal. Not only, but it mimics precisely the vision system of a fly. And at that time, we used neuromorphic engineering, which my colleague David Scaramuzza will probably talk about in, in the next slide. Uh, it was a little bit too early at this stage, but now it's, uh, it's becoming very, very good. Neuromorphic engineering allows you to extract signals and process them at an amazing speed that conventional digital computers cannot do that. But short story is that we achieved this amazing eye, just one 700 small eyes, just like the insects, and less than one millimeter. Now, it turns out that the very first artificial compound eye that was found in nature, was the evolved in nature, was actually cylindrical. And it was used by trilobites living 250 million years ago on the ocean floor. So just like the same size, the same shape of our first artificial compound eye. We discovered this only later on. So it's a nice convergence of biology and engineering coming to the same solution. Um, so. Uh, as we had this compound eyes that was capable of extracting motion, just like insects do, and detecting distances from objects, we put this on a, on a small drone, a wing drone, and we showed that with very few lines of code, essentially extracted information from the visual field of view, just like insects do, we could fly this drone that was not only capable of avoiding obstacles, trees and houses, but also use the same eyes to maintain altitude from the ground, essentially avoiding the ground, always with the same few lines of code. 
And, uh, and at that time, we actually did a lot of work. By uh, it was early 2010. We said, wait, here we have something that we could make drones that can fly autonomously and then land back next to an operator. And so with my PhD students at that time, we founded a company. It was called the SenseFly because the drone was capable of sensing the environment and fly autonomously. And um, uh, we were one of the very early companies in, in the field of drones at that time. Uh, SenseFly became very successful. It was, it was capable of uh, sending drones for inspection of um, agriculture fields or, or long, large spaces. Uh, today is part of the Parrot Group. It still exists. It's still next uh, to EPFL in Lausanne and is a uh, leading uh, company in, uh, in wing drones used for inspection agriculture in all the major markets in the US, Europe, and in Asia. Okay, then uh, at around 2010, I sent a student, Adrien Briot, uh, to Harvard University to do his master uh, project. And uh, his goal at Harvard University was to measure um, uh, the behavior of insects flying in very cluttered environments. So he was filming these insects uh, colliding with walls. When he came back, I realized, wait a minute, these insects are not avoiding the obstacles. They're just colliding head on, withstanding the collision and carrying on. So, so we thought about this problem. And so we, we said, that's amazing. And so this is Adrien. Uh, and we came up, uh, my researchers actually came up with this new drone, which had a, a, a protecting cage, which was freely rotating around the inner propellers. And it was great because the inner propellers were capable of maintaining the drone stable without any special control by simply aerodynamic forces, while the outer cage was absorbing the collision and freely rotating. And so we could fly this drone in the forest with just a magnetic compass. It would manage to fly through the forest while just hitting the obstacles and flying through. Here you see the perspective of the, of the, of the, from the perspective of the drone. The drone was not using vision, it was just flying following the magnetic compass. And so, <laughs> and that's also very safe for humans. You see, this is a Premac, one of the engineers who developed this drone, and so it's very safe for humans too. And so I said, hey, that's great. We could, we have a drone capable of flying in cluttered environments, super safe for humans. You don't need to be an extra uh, super pilot. And so my students founded the second company called Flyability, which today is a leader in uh, inspection drone for cluttered environments like boiler, uh, industrial boilers, uh, tankers, oil tankers, uh, bridges. And um, uh, one of the uh, speakers later on will speak about the next product and uh, how this uh, company is developing uh, uh, these days. So the company, I'm very glad that this is more than five years old, has been a, uh, nominated one of the scale-up companies since we one of the top scale-up companies. These are companies that have went through the startup stage and now they are on a very steady uh, growth path to become a major company. So I'm, I'm very proud of my students of this achievement. So what are we doing these days? One of the possibly next up killer applications, if regulations allow, and if the people allow are interested in this, is to, delivery, uh, to deliver objects through the air. And what you can see, there are many companies, and some of these are no longer there, like Amazon, that are trying to do this. But when you look at these drones, because of the low of aerodynamics, they tend to be very large. In order to carry a load, you either um, uh, fly very fast or spin the propellers very fast, or you have very large aerial surfaces, so wings or propellers. And for that reason, this, since you cannot fly um, faster than a certain amount of kilometers per hour, these drones tend to be quite large. But if you think about delivery of parcels, you tend to think of the post officers giving you the parcel in your hand. So how can we manage to do that in a safe way? And so again, we looked at uh, uh, how insects unfold and fold their wings. And uh, we came up with a new concept of a foldable drone that can you know, unfold when you don't use it. And you can put it away in very small space, like in a, fold, in a, a drawer, or you can fold it uh, around an object, and so essentially it operates like the parcel, like the wrapping paper around a, a parcel. What you see here, the drone, for example, you can send it to a person who is uh, stranded in a building after an earthquake or something, and the person can simply grab the object, open the drone, and get the parcel, for example, emergency kit. 
So that's something that maybe if one day we are allowed to deliver to persons, we could use. Another interesting thing is drone swarms. I believe there will be a lot of drone swarms in the future. Now you say, what's new about drone swarms? We already see these light shows of drones. In this case, Intel 50th anniversary, 2018. They had 2018 drones up in the sky. Now you see many of these these days. The problem is that these drones, although this is clever in terms of software and hardware, these drones are not autonomous. Each drone is controlled by computer on the ground and the computer controls precisely the trajectory of each drone as if they were pixels so that for they perform a certain motion so they don't collide and they display a new image but if you look at the way in which animals fly for example birds how they flock is that they do not have a central computer telling them where they go we know now that they use vision and they monitor the position of their neighbors they approximately monitor apparently something between five and seven neighbors plus they look also the outer perimeter of of the flock and essentially they use only local rules they do visual recognition of the other agents or birds and they use um, uh, local rules. And so with my students we came up with the drones that can that have omnidirectional cameras on board and they use machine learning to recognize the other drones against any background, in this case you know, on the sunset, it could be against uh, um, trees. Uh, what you see, these are only three drones, it's not a really, we cannot talk about this flock or this worm yet, but all these drones they do is that they don't use GPS, they look at each other, then they self-organize to design which trajectory they, they move. We also uh, most recently look at the how these drones can flock together and fly through obstacles and then reunite at the end of, of, the, of, the, of the, with this artificial forest, so to speak. So I believe this is something that we will see more in the future, uh, having more drones that um, autonomous fly together. Now, I've shown to you uh, some work with quadrotors, and then what we are working on recently is to achieve the amazing agility of some birds of prey, as in this case the goshawk or the falcon. What you see is that these, these, these birds can manage to achieve very sharp turns, or they can fly very slow, by morphing their wing and tail. And so uh, we are now developing feather drone, you see here one of the, our prototypes, that are capable of morphing their wing and tail, to perform very agile maneuvers, therefore um, um, uh, they also make the, the problem of controlling this drone super difficult. In this case, the, the feather drone that you can see here is controlled by a, um, a very a skilled pilot, but what we are doing now with my colleague David Scaramuzza is to, and PhD students, is to make this completely autonomous. So this is the next challenge. I want to close my presentation by saying that in Switzerland we have a very fertile ground and with a lot of research uh, happening at the, in Zurich, in Lausanne, and other institutions uh, in the field of drones. And over the years, we had, recent years, I must say, a number of companies that develop new drone software and hardware solutions, and we have established companies that you see on this board uh, that uh, develop services or components for, for drones. So, so it's a great place to be um, uh, for doing research and for doing business. And um, one of the reasons I just want to say is not only that we have great research institutions like EPFL, ETH, uh, University of Zurich and instruments like the robotic center that can support uh, many of these projects for a longer period of time, but also we have a very flexible regula regulatory um, agency, uh, the Federal Office of Civil Aviation in Switzerland. The first time we operated this drone, uh, it was 2009, 2008. We were flying these drones up in the sky and then we asked ourselves, are we allowed to fly these drones over the campus? And so we called, we said, who should we ask? We called the Federal Office of Civil Aviation and we said, can we fly these drones? And they said, drones? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> drones at that time were just unmanned, uh, dangerous um, uh, drones for, with weapons. Wait a minute, we come down from Bern, they came down to Lausanne and they looked, oh, that's very interesting. So, and very eas easily they gave us a letter of permission you see here, that allowed us to fly over the campus. Of course, we had to fulfill some safety requirements, but they allowed us to fly, and it was great. And over the years, they developed a very nice environment where researchers and companies can, uh, with the, they can, they can benefit from special regulations that allow us to test uh, new rules. And I would like to conclude this with um, thanking also the pragmatic aspect that we or attitude that we have in Switzerland. It is our former counselor, uh, Doris Leuter. What she said is, we must first understand technology before we regulate it. In some countries instead is, first we set the rules, you cannot do anything, 
and then you develop the technology. So it's this pragmatic approach also that allows us to uh, go from research to so many companies. Thank you very much for your attention. much. You can uh, take it and give it to David in a second. Um, thank you so much for this uh, quick overview. I think there are so many topics that we can deep, dig deeper into. That's what I want to say. Um, thank you for now. And uh, in a second, we will welcome you for the panel discussion. But first, we already heard uh, from Dario that uh, Professor David Skaramuza is here as well. And he will also hold a very short presentation. He is a professor of robotics and perception at both departments of informatics at the University of Zurich and neuroinformatics, uh, also University of Zurich and the ETH Zurich, where he does research at the intersection of robotics, computer vision and neuroscience more about this um, and he led many many projects uh, published many papers written books and founded also companies in the robotic field and now he's here on stage to talk about his re research and also the spin-off so please welcome him professor david skaramuza welcome nice to have you here is it working yes, yes. No, it is. thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me here as you can read in the title, I want to talk about how we can build autonomous drones that can one day possibly outperform human pilots. So if you read uh, the latest uh, drone reports, they actually claim that the drone market now is quite large. It's worth uh, 24 billion US dollars. And the, the most uh, profitable markets are actually inspection of difficult infra infrastructure like bridges, agriculture, also cutting fruits or uh, spraying uh, pesticides, transport uh, of goods, and finally security and monitoring, like search and rescue applications uh, and more. But uh, what actually they don't say is that uh, all the autonomous drones that you see out there are either controlled by GPS or they are not autonomous at all. In fact, they are controlled by human pilots. So actually 99% of all commercial drones are controlled either by humans or by a GPS. Now, humans are still the most used, in fact, uh, because they are unbeatable. They are really great at controlling drones, and I will show you later in the videos what I mean. However, the problem with uh, human pilots is that, uh, you know, they take a lot of time to train, usually months or even up to a year, and the other problem is that they require a direct line of sight between the operator and the drone. So on the other side, there is GPS-based autopilot. So the drone can, in principle, fly by itself, provided that there is GPS. And that's where, actually, the, the problem comes. Because what happens when there is no GPS? Like when you, for example, walk outside here, there is very little GPS coverage. That means that, actually, drones will not be able to operate outside of this building. And when GPS actually fails, what happens? Well, then drones crash from the skies. Switzerland was the first country in the world to allow autonomous operation beyond line of sight of drones to transport deliveries of goods. They started in Lugano in 2017, then Bern, Zurich, and they performed more than 5,000 flights autonomously. So because they were the first, they were also the first to have uh, autonomous drones crashing from the skies. And uh, the first crash happened in uh, January 2019, and the second crash three months later. So the Swiss Post actually had to suspend the operation for like more than a year. Now they just resumed it. But at the origin of the crash was a GPS failure. So the question is, can we have uh, autonomous drones that can navigate without GPS? And the answer is yes, of course, doing like we humans or animals do, using cameras, their onboard eyes. And this is what I mean. Basically, this is one of our drones. So we have uh, the eyes here on the bottom. You can put one or multiple cameras. In this case, this drone has actually four cameras for different tasks. And then we have the brain, which is basically a very powerful computer. This drone is actually quite uh, small, like about uh, 20 centimeters in size. So when uh, a drone relies on cameras to fly, so we call this vision-based navigation. And actually, it's a quite new technology, and m most people don't know about it. It actually started 12 years ago as part of a European project. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about this story. Here you see 
how the drone navigates uh, only using uh, a camera. We only have a single camera. The camera is looking down at the, seal, at the floor, and when my student actually moves the drone, the drone goes back to the starting position because at the moment it's trying to hover stably in the air. How does it work? Basically, the, the onboard computer analyzes the images and extracts some salient points. So some points that can be used as anchor points, like reference. And then uh, when the, my student moves or disturbs the drone, the onboard computer analyzes the motion of these anchor points and then it computes how much it should uh, move back in order to stabilize the, the drone to the original position. So now you can use the same technology also to tell the drone how to navigate, for example, among obstacles to go from A to B. So that's the, the underlying basic idea. We started this uh, 12 years ago, and we were the first to demonstrate the vision-based autonomous navigation of a drone in 2009. We participated uh, uh, in a competition where we wanted to fly a drone uh, from the floor to a small house inside a university gym. However, at that time, 12 years ago, we didn't have enough computing power to do all the processing of the images on board, so we used a, tw a 20 meters long USB cable that was connecting the onboard camera to that laptop over there on the, s on the floor. And also the regulations didn't allow us to fly freely in a university gym, so we had to actually secure the drone with a fishing rod. That's why my student is uh, securing the drone with a fishing rod. And then there was the moment where basically we had the drone was to pass through a window. And here, basically, was, uh, was the end of the demonstration. But this was actually the first uh, really, truly vision-based autonomous flight. What happened then? So after the, the end of the European project, actually, DARPA was inspired by this project. DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency of the United States of America. And in 2015, they launched the first uh, um, program to investigate the use of cameras for autonomous navigation of drones without GPS. I was lucky actually to be part of this program. Only three members were part of this program. And the program ran for three years. It was called FLA, Fast Lightweight Autonomy Program. It was not top secret. Actually, we released all the publications uh, uh, publicly, all the code, so anyone can use it. And here you see what we were able to perform after, you know, six years from, this, from the European project. We were able to have uh, the first drone even exploring a forest and entering a house all completely autonomously. Uh, where do we stand today? Well, today is 2021, and we have actually autonomous drones doing vision-based navigation on Mars. So this technology basically was inspired, you know, by an idea that we had uh, 10 years ago. And now what's next? Well, the real big challenge is to make drones navigate as good or maybe even better than human pilots. What you see in this video is not an autonomous drone, but it's not a drone controlled by a human pilot. So there is a camera on the drone that transmits the images uh, very quickly to some um, uh, goggles, and then uh, the brain processing the images, and then it sends control commands through a remote. But what is impressive is that humans can actually you know, fly drones in very cluttered and very challenging environments like this. So can we build autonomous drones, or actually can we build uh, an alpha pilot, so a software that can actually analyze the onboard images and control the drone autonomously as good or even better than a human pilot? That's a big research question that we're facing now. But why? Why do we want to fly better than human pilots? Uh, the reason is the following. At the moment, all the search and rescue operations of drones that you see out there in the news, they are performed by human pilots, not by autonomous drones. The Fukushima decommissioning of the nuclear power plant will take 40 years to be performed, and there are humans behind those robots. The building that, uh, that collapsed in Miami this summer that killed 100 people was then monitored by nine drones, all controlled by humans. The Twin Towers attack, the 9-11 attack, was also, you know, investigated by human pilots. Why were autonomous drones never sent there? Because it's too difficult to navigate drones in search and rescue environment. They're just too difficult. And there is a, but there is a problem with human pilots. They cannot go too far because they rely on signal transmission. So usually 200, 300 meters. So what about Fukushima that is actually over kilometers? 
There is another problem though. Drones can only fly for 10 to 20 minutes. Now, if I want to explore all this building in 10, 20 minutes, there is one solution though with the same drone, it's to fly fast. If you fly fast, you cover longer distances. So that means we need to fly better than, you drone, better than humans, more agilely than humans. And if we can do this, we will also enable, you know, flying, you know, the, for uh, delivering goods and exploring unknown environments uh, very fastly and very efficiently. So that's the whole idea that we are working on. What's the, now the recipe behind achieving human, uh, superhuman pilot performance? Well, the idea is to use artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? We read often in the news, but uh, very little people know. So artificial in intelligence consists of programming the robot by examples, which means show the computer what to do without explaining how to do it. So basically the idea is that uh, you show, for example, the robot uh, a series of simulations and how to behave in a simulation, maybe a human can show it, or maybe a sophisticated algorithm built by human can show it, and then the algorithm learns to imitate these examples at best and maybe even improving itself uh, over time with experience. So we started doing this uh, already uh, like uh, four years ago and one of the first experiments that we ran was uh, a drone that used AI to imitate cars and bicycles. Basically we had a drone that learned by watching YouTube videos how to fly. But not videos recorded from drones, but videos recorded from cars and bicycles. So we had to tell the AI program how to adapt uh, what he learned from uh, cars and bicycles and transfer that uh, to flying. Scaramuzza. Scaramuzza. Ah, yeah, okay. It's okay. Slide uh, 13, yes. Another example, in this case, instead we use the AI, and we combine with a very fast uh, camera to dodge objects thrown at the drone. So here my student is launching a ball and the drone is flying at 10 meters per second, so 40 kilometers per hour, and then with this special camera, we were able to detect the ball and to trigger an evasive maneuver to avoid it. More recently, we started working on autonomous drone racing, where the goal is to actually beat a human at a, a real competition. In this case, the human is the red drone and the autonomous one is the blue drone. Still, the human is a little bit faster, 0 0.1 second faster, but we're almost there. And actually, this is our human pilot. Uh, his name is Marvin. He's only 15 years old. It happens, actually, that uh, the youngest are also the, the fastest human pilots. And this not, sh should not be a surprise because they have uh, the fastest reflexes. This is another recent work where we use the, an AI to teach this drone how to fly acrobatic maneuvers. Now, what I want to say is that in all these videos that you just saw, there was an AI behind. But how did the AI learn to fly? Did you actually fly all these drones in the skies or in your lab? And how many times did you have to fly? Actually, this is the problem. In order to learn how to fly, we actually needed thousands of flight hours. Means months. We didn't have this time. Nobody, none of my PhD students have this time. So how we, did we do it? We did it in simulation. Simulation is fast, it's cheap, and it's safe. We actually simulated uh, thousands of hours of actual flight in just four hours. By simulating hundreds of drones flying in parallel, for each drone we had uh, a GPU, a specific unit in the PC, in the computer, that was simulating a specific drone. So here you see all the possible drones that we simulated. Uh, on the left you see what we simulated, and on the right you see how it performs, like in simulation. The big challenge though is to make simulation as close as possible to reality, and that's what we are working on. And now, 
what's the next key challenge for today's robots? So we've seen that you know, we are pushing the performance in order to beat humans one day, but the real challenge would be to get drones able to enter this rubble. What you see here is a picture of the famous Miami building that collapsed a few months ago. How can we get drones into the rubble? And the only way to get them into the rubble is to make drones smaller and smaller, like this one over here. But the smaller the drones are, the more stupid they are at the moment. Because at the moment, sophisticated and powerful computer needs to be large and bulky and heavy. So the real uh, challenge is to actually now make this algorithm capable of running on tiny drones, like the one I brought over here today that is this small, and this drone has two cameras and a small computer, so that would be the next big challenge. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, especially all the people behind and our sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. You can keep it for now. You can also sit down if you like, because we're about to start um, wherever you... Yeah, perfect, that's fine. Um, wow, thank you. It's. It's been so interesting, so many information. I, I uh, imagine you're feeling the same right now. But we're going to dig deeper in our panel now. So please let me welcome to our panel as well um, Dario Floriano again. So, and um, you may sit there if you like. And also we're welcoming Francine Zimmermann. Uh, she works at the Federal Office of Civic Aviation, the FUCA in Switzerland, and she's responsible for developing the strategy, policy, and the international regulations for all those emerging technologies, such as civil drones and UTM. So she's the perfect um, expert for this. And also she co-leads the FUCA Innovation and Digitalization Unit. So she's also very involved in this is new technologies and digital airspace. So welcome. This is your applause. Nice to have you here. <laughs> and from Germany, we are welcoming Simon Kum. He is the CEO and also a, dry, a drone pilot of Inspec Drone GmbH. It's a company that is based here in Stuttgart. And they are doing a plant and power plant inspections using a special confined space drone. What exactly that is, we will find out. Welcome. <laughs> So very nice to have you all here. You all have your microphones. Yeah, perfect. You also have water if you need this. All right. So I said in the beginning um, that uh, a lot of uh, experts are saying that this decade, the 20s, are going to be the next big golden age for flights. What is your opinion as an expert? Are we going to have a golden age of flight, Dario? Oh, you don't have a microphone, sorry. Yeah, it would be no. good if you two share and you two share. <laughs> okay. Well, we... Um, yeah, yeah, it's on. So we, in a sense, we already have a, a golden age. I think I think the, the answer should come from Francine because uh, uh, we have all these beautiful things in the, in the labs and uh, sometimes you can make companies, but then we cannot fly all, all the time. Uh, in Switzerland, it's very permissive, but... I, th I think regulations is um, regulations and public acceptance yeah, is, is one of the roadblocks, maybe, from my perspective. So I would like to know what Francine thinks about this. Well, Francine, what do you think about it? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, we have already daily drone operation in Switzerland, but it's still it's only, uh, I mean, some operation. And for me, we need now the next step is how to scale. Because the industry... Okay, here we have like research institutes, but we also have the industry, a lot of industry players in Switzerland. And I mean, at some point, they also need to make money and to have business. So for me, really, the, the next step is now how to scale. Uh, we have been, I mean, as I said, very um, like open uh, to enable those operations. I mean, we have the, the chance that we have a research institute like APFL and ETH and also other in Switzerland. So. As a regulator, we can be either enabler or we can hinder innovation. We choose very early that we want to enable this, but now I think we really need to go one step uh, more uh, and really to, to scale. So that's for me the, the goal uh, the next couple of years. To scale it. But talking about scaling is already a really good thing because um, I think some countries might be even even less, you know, that we, and this is exactly what in your presentation really struck to me in the end when you said we must first understand technology before we regulate it, which was has been said. Is this something that you also would, would uh, say, yes, this is something 
Yes, of I course. I think uh, as well. Yes, I think it's key. And that's why we, we launched uh, almost three, uh, three years ago a private-public partnership called uh, SUSI, Swiss Youth Peace Implementation. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was FOCAS, so the Federal Office of Civil Aviation, together with our ANSP Sky Guide and about uh, 30 industry players from everywhere, from the US, from Europe, from Australia, everywhere. And we really said, okay, we want to understand, to Regulation is not here yet, so it's coming. Now we have a new Europe regulation, but it's still at the, at the early beginning. So we said we really want to, to test the technology, to understand it, and then to do really good regulation mm -hmm. and taking that into account. So we started that three years ago, and it ha has been really useful for everybody. So it's on a voluntary basis. Everybody who wants to, to join can come, and we, we test the technology. So yes, uh, I, I fully agree with what also uh, Miss Leutard said and what Dayo mentioned before. It's really key f for, for, for us and for the whole community mm -hmm. that, that we go that way. Before we go deeper into regulations, because I think we do have to explain a little bit more what kind of regulations there are actually are at the moment. But um, Simon, I'm looking to you first. So my question about the golden age, what do you say uh, being a CEO of a drone company? Okay, I can only speak for a very special part of the drone uh, flying uh, because where we fly, we are not regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, so, sorry for <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> we fall out of uh, this area. Um, but but I, yeah, I, I would join this opinion that we, we are on this uh, path where a lot is possible, but it needs to be or, yeah, a, a lot is technically possible. Yeah. And yeah, the, the scaling really, uh, you have various partners. You have the industry. Uh, from our experience, it's already, for some industries, a problem to accept new technologies. Mm -hmm. So you have the, like you said, the public acceptance. You also have this, not only for the public, but for, for companies also to realize, okay, there is a new technology, we have to implement it or we have to see how we can work with it. Um, and, but everything has to go together. So regulation, acceptance. Um, Definitely. Yeah. It's exactly what I was wondering um, listening to your two presentations. I was wondering, is actually the problem now the regulation or the Technic. Is it still not developed enough or do we have too much regulation? It's exactly what was going on in my head, uh, David. So I think it's a problem of both. Now, uh, depending on the country, one can be more dominant than the other one. Certainly in Switzerland, uh, it's, uh, it was the first. It's, um, it's very um, uh, open-minded and so it's possible to test uh, new technologies that in other countries would not be really possible. So it was the first country in Europe to authorize a beyond visual line of sight autonomous operation of drones. So they started with the Swiss Post and also with other uh, services. In Africa also they allowed that. In Rwanda and Ghana, for example, there is a company that is uh, flying uh, uh, blood samples uh, 25 kilometers away with the fixed wing drones. Uh, but the US was also one of the last countries, actually, surprisingly. Now, now they're actually starting. So countries that actually have uh, uh, low income uh, surprisingly, they were the first to authorize the visual beyond line okay. of sight uh, autonomous drones because they needed it. So that's the need that drives, in the end, uh, uh, the acceptance of it. Them now in Zurich, for example, there were a lot of public complaints from uh, people about the drones flying between the university hospital and another lab because uh, they were flying sometimes, occasionally over houses. So, however, they were flying over during the day, uh, during the day. But some people complain about the noise. So noise is actually now a, a big stopper, for example, if you want to use drones for delivering goods within uh, cities. So we have to wait and see. Of course, there is a lot of research that needs to be done in order to reduce noise. Uh, we know how to do this. Uh, you need the smaller drones. But then you cannot, for example, f uh, lift uh, very heavy loads. Uh, there are also uh, active noise cancelling uh, technologies, the same ones that we use for our noise cancelling mm -hmm. headphones, for example, that can be used, but they, they are still uh, confined to research labs. And, uh, and then there is safety. Safety is another problem. You know, two drones crashed out of 5,000 autonomous flights in Switzerland. Uh, what is the other company that is actually scaling up a lot? It's Zipline. They did more than 200,000 autonomous flights in Rwanda, but they are using fixed wings. Then the worst case scenario, they don't fall down vertically, but they glide. 
so they are safer. So quad rotors are still, uh, you know, my, a big concern if something goes wrong. But there are already technologies that can prevent them from crashing if a rotor fails, if the GPS fails. So, but we need to uh, basically first see whether this technology is mature enough to be deployed. Mm -hmm. Okay. With the noise, I don't know if you've ever been here before when our drone and our drone parkour is flying. It is very, very loud. Uh, makes working or talking uh, quite impossible. So it's interesting to talk about this. Um, uh, talking about regulations. So what kind of regulations do we need to also ensure, obviously, safety, but still that the technology is still further developing. What kind of technology, uh, what kind of regulations, um, where are we at the moment in Switzerland and what would you say, what do we need as well? So the key that, that we need is really a risk-based regulation. So performance-based and risk-based regulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, Professor Skarmuza mentioned the, the two incidents that we had with mm -hmm. one of the drone. I would like here to say that yes, the drone, they, they, they fall from the sky, but we had mitigation measure in places and everything happened how it should happen if the drone is out of control. Mm -hmm. So it was incident, but nobody get injured or yeah. um, so nothing happened. So of course we are not saying that, so we are allowing those operation. So we need to, to, to be confident that it's safe enough, that it's good. Uh, but we are not saying that drone will never fall from the sky because I mean, it's like everything, I mean, it's, it can happen. But the idea of uh, this uh, risk-based approach that we have in Switzerland, but also in Europe and also in, in, in the US are working with that as well, and, and, and in China as well, in Australia, almost worldwide, is really to work with mitigation measures. So we have several layer of mitigation measures, and given all those layers, we can be confident that we can fly safely. Mm -hmm. So if one of the layer will uh, don't not function, we will have another, another, another. Yeah, but still, I've heard that in Switzerland, the regulations are a bit, well, not as stringent in as like in Germany or the rest of Europe. Uh, what can you say about that? Yeah, so th th that's <laughs> a, bit a, a tricky question. So actually, there is an harmonized uh, European regulation on drones uh, entered into force uh, one year ago, about one year ago. Um, so it does not apply to Switzerland yet, so we have some discussion in the parliament, so we were not able to, to take that regulation, even if we have a bilateral agreement on air transport with Europe, so we are supposed to, to take over those regulations. So we are not, I mean, it doesn't apply to Switzerland. However, um, I was personally um, at old meeting uh, five, six years ago when we started to write those regulations. So meaning today we are already very, uh, like, similar to what the rules uh, applying in Europe. You mentioned Germany. I think Germany has a complexity that is maybe a little bit uh, similar to Switzerland. In Switzerland, you have the cantons that have also some like right, you know, and they can decide things. I think in Germany is even more <laughs> complex with the lender. <laughs> so uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess maybe the, the question from, from that and maybe also, uh, I mean, the, the issue or the challenge Maybe given the fact that we started very early, I mean, Professor Florano mentioned uh, 2009, I remember, and I was not there, but my engineer then, they, they told me the story in 2009 when they came to us and said, we would like to fly 15 drones in Bivilos in Bijan, beyond vision line of sight. And we were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How can we allow that? But we didn't say no. And so given the fact that we start very early, I think we, we have, we had the time to, uh, to uh, really to experiment and, and you know, to learn uh, based on, on really practical examples. So maybe, I don't know, in Germany, I mean, uh, I'm sure S uh, Simon know that better, but maybe they didn't have the chance to, to try many things and maybe they, they just need a, a little bit more of experience. M maybe we just need a bit of time. <laughs> what do you think, Simon? Uh, yeah, we, we need time and of course we need people who go forward, who who push the limits and maybe test out what is possible. Um, I, I'm not the expert for, for laws uh, here uh, because we rarely come into contact with that, but everything that I know from others who are flying, it's not that easy. Um, especially when we talk about startup companies. In Germany, as you mentioned, you have the Bundesländer and for every Bundesland you need your more or less your own license to fly. Or you need a permit in each of the 16 Bundesländer. Uh, nice. <laughs> so yeah, great fun. If you want to <laughs> offer any flight services German-wide, 
you need to cover all of them. And of course, it's an additional fee in every Bundesland. So, yeah, it's nice. not easy to get into that field. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah, I mean, it's not the biggest hurdle to go over, but um, sure makes it a bit more difficult. Definitely. But I was thinking um, as well, isn't it like with every new technology? I mean, uh, back then, you know, when cars were new, nobody wanted to get into a car because it could be crashing and dangerous. And then we had planes and everything. So isn't this also just this, this acceptance just needs, you know, it just needs a bit more time? Or uh, Dario, what's, what's your opinion on this uh, social acceptance and how can we also achieve it? How can we get drones into being more normal around us? Yeah, I think uh, you're right. It, it takes time. And um, uh, I think uh, young people, as many here in the audience, I not sh actually would like to know their opinion. But mm. when I see the, the students, they are not particularly concerned by, by the technology. Mm -hmm. There is an <laughs> issue maybe of privacy. Maybe that's that's a topic, but um, not particularly concerned, I think. Um, yeah, so, so I think it takes time. And... Yeah. Um, but it's true that if we have accidents and um, and those accidents are are so far they didn't they were not problematic, but if in the future they are problematic, that could block uh, social acceptance, and then yeah, and then there would be uh, uh, there would be limitations to what the companies can do. Does anyone have yeah. a different opinion on this? <laughs> All the same. <laughs> Maybe I can add one point. I mean, social acceptance is a big thing, but I think we need to really to tell people what we do with those drones. Because, I mean, we had the, the example of the blood uh, blood sample in Lugano and, and, and in Zurich. And, I mean, in Lugano now, uh, I mean, uh, as Professor Skarmuza mentioned, uh, we started four years ago there in, uh, in, in back in 2017. And uh, I was there uh, two weeks ago because now they, they have, like, a station and they... they uh, because they want to be more autonomous, they have their, like it's like a floor where the drone can can land there, and I was there to to, to watch that. And the people uh, in Lugano, uh, most of the people, they know about the drones, and it's really well accepted because they know they are doing useful things. So I think here, if we tell people what we do with the drones, uh, they will, I mean, they will accept it. I, I, I'm sure. I'm I'm really confident. But we we need to, yeah, we need to to involve them. Yeah, maybe I just want to add something. Why is our drone so special? About why do people concern so much? And uh, and probably it's the only instance of a machine that moves without a human. So you don't see the human. It's like imagine you see one of these mm -hmm. Tesla cars, and you don't see a human sitting on the on the steering wheel. You would be very concerned too. So that's probably the reason why. At the same time, when you think that you fly uh, on a jet. Uh, and then the pilot is not controlling anything, it's just sitting there. It's a very similar situation, and you are sitting up there. So uh, it's probably a matter of, as you say, making sure that people understand what these drones are doing today. Probably a lot of people say, well, there could be a human somewhere, there could be no human, there could be a kid, there could be no kid. Uh, probably it's that, that's the situation we are in. But mm. as if it is regulated, uh, things will change, I think. Okay. Um, Sorry, did you want to add something? Uh, want yes, to uh, one, one thing, uh, may, um, we talk about the future, future now, um, but the, the, the current state is always hard to break through. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, uh, you are working at a university, you are doing research for future projects. Uh, I think it's a bit different there. You have always new students, you have young people, you have new ideas, you want to go forward. It's a, from my experience, it's a bit different in the industry because by the time that you have someone in a position to make decisions, they are usually already a few years into their job and they tend to do things, of course, as they have always been done. Uh, I think it's a problem in every field, but um, yeah, we, we sometimes really need, like the example with blood samples or with really good examples to show people Yes, it makes sense. Use drones, they have good use um, to just open their eyes. Because not everyone is as open-minded as uh, researchers at universities. 
totally agree with you. So let's open some eyes and let's talk. Maybe uh, you can keep the microphone. Um, let's talk about some use cases that we already have and what kind of industries we already seen some examples. What is already possible? What is uh, happening? But you have uh, something a bit different. Uh, we haven't. S yeah, we have seen that a little bit. But maybe we can go deeper into this. Uh, what exactly your yeah, company sure. is doing? It's not regulated where you fly. <laughs> I already heard that. So Ninety-nine percent is Na unregulated. I would say. Okay. Yeah. So tell us. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I will. Uh, so we are uh, operating a drone inspection company and we're specialized in inspections for confined spaces, meaning everything from boilers, uh, power boilers, to flue gas stacks, to uh, large vessels, uh, to underground ducts like sewers, um, and yeah, we are based here in Stuttgart, actually. I came by uh, Straßenbahn today. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we, we operate uh, German-wide. And yeah, we, we often have this topic of bringing new technology to industries which are very traditional. Uh, so cement industry, uh, wood, pro uh, wood production, chemical industry very traditional in Germany um, yeah it's not that easy to bring it to them um, and we, we actually use the product which is usually displayed uh, right next to this uh, panel stage here um, the Ilios 2 from flyability um, Dario already had the grandfather uh, I would say <laughs> of our current drone in his presentation uh, I mean the, <laughs> it, it takes a very short time from generation to generation with drones uh, other than with humans. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I think you, when, when did you uh, found or when, when did flyability leave university? 2012, 13? Um, so that was uh, 2015. Oh. Yes. So you just okay. saved yourself with that oh. uh, comment, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, from, from, I mean, I think it, it shows very well how quickly the technology evolves. I mean, uh, the, the company was founded in 2015 with the uh, development of the first version of this inspection drone. Uh, now we use the second drone for the second year now, and we're currently in cooperation with the uh, with flyability to develop the third iteration so everything moves really fast maybe we so can show the audience as yes, well a little um, bit something in, in addition to, to, to the uh, video we saw earlier uh, in the presentation we have a short one here to show you what we can do I'm not sure if we have audio, otherwise you can explain as well. Ah, we have audio. Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Mein Name ist Simon Kum. Ich bin äh, Geschäftsführer der Inspectron GmbH. Wir setzen die Elios 1 und auch die Elios 2 von Flyability ein, um in Industriebereichen äh, Inspektionen für unsere Kunden durchzuführen. Was ganz wichtig ist für den Kunden hier am Standort ist das Thema Arbeitssicherheit und hier kann natürlich die Elios 2 von Flyability einen äh, riesen Vorteil bieten und ganz klar punkten. Der Grund, warum wir heute hier in der Anlage sind, ist, dass der Kunde mit Hilfe der Elios 2 von Flyability die Stillstandszeiten verkürzen möchte und eben die Anlagenteile zugänglich machen, für die sonst ein komplizierter Einstieg erforderlich ist. Die Inspektion in dieser Anlage wurde bisher manuell ausgeführt, das heißt durch Einfahren in die Anlage. Und äh, in manchen Anlagenbereichen musste man einfach warten, bis man auch von außen was gesehen hat, weil die komplett unzugänglich sind. Die äh, Vorteile, die die Elios 2 bringt in solchen Anlagen, ist äh, hauptsächlich die sehr viel bessere Ausleuchtung. Dadurch äh, kann man sich einfach deutlich besser orientieren. Die weiteren Vorteile der Elios 2 liegen natürlich in der deutlich verbesserten Bildqualität ähm, und auch in der Stabilität im Flug wodurch man kritische Stellen noch besser orten kann. Die Reaktionen der Kunden sind generell sehr positiv. 
Bei den meisten steht im Vordergrund das Thema Arbeitssicherheit, was eben hervorragend durch diese Drohne unterstützt wird. Die Schlüsselpunkte für die Kunden sind zum einen die Möglichkeit, Stillstände zu verkürzen durch eine schnellere Inspektion und zum anderen die Steigerung der Sicherheit. Durch den Einsatz der Drohne kann eben der Einsatz von Personen in Innenräumen reduziert werden. Ja, die Zukunft der Inspektion in Deutschland, in Industrieanlagen, da sehe ich ganz klar Drohnen als einen wichtigen Teil im Rahmen der Automatisierung, der Digitalisierung. Not our logo. Um Actually, we, we did this um, video together with the manufacturer of the drone, Flyability. Uh, I think it was beginning of 2020. Yeah, sh shortly before Corona. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we could still meet there. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't actually aware that I uh, talked about the future uh, <laughs> of inspections there, but uh, I think it's a nice touch. Um, and yeah what, what what i wanted to point out is that uh what we saw earlier in the presentation the the, the drone um that had no gps and flew through the woods um actually here we also have no gps with the latest model but uh we have like the early version of this uh, navigation using visuals so we have uh, cameras sensing motion, we have distance sensors. Um, that's why the videos, uh, some of the videos were taken with this drone. So we had two on site to follow each other. Um, it gives a re really good stability. I think it's only a, a first step towards what you're researching, but it's, it, it shows that it's already making an impact on real world use. Not, it's not just academic, it's not just someone imagining something, but it's, it really has a huge impact uh, on industries. Yeah. Any, sorry, did you want to say something? <laughs> No, I would like okay. to um, take uh, the opportunity to say that actually, indeed, the vision-based navigation now is becoming more and more mature. There are already many drones, especially the DJI drones. So DJI is the, the, the world's largest drone manufacturer from China, Shenzhen. And actually, all their drones have uh, multiple cameras, at least uh, six cameras to do obstacle avoidance omnidirectionally, automatic takeoff and landing. Um, and also there, are, uh, there is another company from the US, the largest in the US, it's called the Skydio, that actually has also multiple cameras that they can do autonomous inspection as well. So basically the drone decides where to take pictures in order to get the best 3D model of the bridge or of the, the, the wall that you want to inspect. So this is also you know, already entering the, 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 the market and we will see more and more. But now the real future will be to get them smaller, safer, so that they can get close to individuals, possibly with cages, and they have uh, the human less and less in control of these drones. However, the drone, the, the drone can still be, you know, re requiring some high level input from a human. That's what uh, we would still call a level. So there are five levels of autonomy, typically in automotive. And uh, now mm -hmm. these five levels of autonomy are coming also to drones. Actually, just last year, the, they were for the first uh, time um, categorized. And so the first uh, uh, level of autonomy is called a zero level, means the, the drone is completely manually controlled. Then let's say, let's jump to ma uh, level three. It means it can do takeoff and landing and some uh, easy obstacle avoidance. Level four means that actually the, the, the human only gives uh, waypoints and then the, 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 the drone plus passes through these waypoints. But level five is that the, the drone does almost everything and the human actually gives a, a high level uh, the description of the task. For example, enter into this building, map it, localize the survivors of the earthquake, come back and return to me a 3D map with the position of the victims. We are not there yet. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's you know, mm -hmm. the thing that we, we are going to have soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a matter of time. And people will accept it, I'm sure. Are you also using artificial intelligence uh, in your field as well? Uh, we did the first tests mm -hmm. with this, um, especially that it's also a Swiss company, of course, <laughs> um, doing, uh, they provide an AI that can inspect uh, sewers. So where you 
your wastewater goes through, mm -hmm. um, you can uh, automatically identify like cracks and you can, uh, yeah, it, it, it basically gives you a full report that normally you do manually. Mm. Uh, and nobody really so wants to do that. So it's highly interesting, the combination, I think, of AI and drones or computer learning, however uh, you want to call it, uh, is definitely part of the future. And I mean, y you notice with, with the, f uh, which I'm not sure in which presentation it was, the drone with the USB cable. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you can replace the USB, ca USB cable once you have more powerful computers using less energy. Um, but then again, the German, uh, the German person in me pops up and it goes like, okay, drones are already really bad. And then yes, we also have are. artificial they, they intelligence. Yes. Oh my God, <laughs> what do you say as <laughs> being a regulator? How do we solve this then? By the way, I'm not thinking like this. It's just <laughs> me being German. <laughs> yeah, maybe I want to take one step back uh, because we were speaking about, about a lot about drones and how can we make them autonomous. A uh, very important uh, topic we are working on, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, SUSE, the Swiss Youth Space Implementation, is to digitalize the airspace. Because currently, I mean, of course, manned aviation, uh, we have people, I mean, looking that the, 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 uh, the aircraft, they don't uh, collide, right? But we, we cannot have this for drones. So you cannot have like one person uh, like checking that the drone, they, they, uh, they, they don't uh, collide. And as we are not there yet, that they are autonomous and intelligent, that they <laughs> avoid themselves, we are working on... on um, <coughs> bless Sorry. you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we are working on, on uh, how to digit digitalize this, uh, this airspace. So we are starting uh, at a very uh, um, low level. And uh, because you, you may know that uh, at European level, we will have a youth space regulation starting early 2023. It will enter into force uh, with a couple of youth space services. So it means how can we automate like how we can have like network remote identification so that, that, that it will help also the acceptance because the general public can then know who is flying here. The drone, uh, they can also um, spread information about why they are flying here. So everything will be connected. So we are really working on that now with the industry and with our ANSP. So I think this is also one way. I mean, there are the drones, but also the, the air traffic management that need to be uh, like di digitalized. And AI is, uh, I would say, the, the next step. It, it will come for sure. I mean, it will come. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sure of that. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's also a good development. But uh, yeah, we need to do one step after, after the other. Otherwise, uh, I mean, the, the public acceptance that, will, uh, that needs time. I would really love to have uh, a German regulator here on the panel to, to see if there is the same openness. And uh, yeah, before I ask a final question, I would like to turn my head to our wonderful audience. If you have any questions to our panel, and yes, we are coming with a microphone. It will just take a second. Um, Michaela, if you could be here to the front. Here. <laughs> she will hold it for you or not. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for for your talks. Um, I wanted to ask something. So it looks like on this way to uh, these small uh, insect-like drones, this problem of uh, very lightweight and powerful uh, energy sources uh, is like one of the major ones. Uh, what do you think are the prospects in this realm in the nearest future? So there are several uh, possibilities to counteract the, the energy shortage. So there are already, although not commercially available, sulfus, uh, um, uh, what is it called, uh, polymer batteries that would uh, be able to extend the duration of a battery. Then there are also fuel cells that could also bring uh, the duration from 20 minutes to up to one hour for a common quadrotor. Uh, however, again, they are not commercially available. They are quite bulky. Um, now, if you have to think also that there are not just uh, multi rotors around there, so quadrotors, hexacopter, uh, octocopter. There are also fixed wings. The reason why, for example, zip line uh, uses fixed wings is because they also glide, so they actually need much less energy. They can fly for more than an hour. So, so that, that's also something to take into account. So depending on the application, consider a different drone. Another thing to say about energy is uh, 
uh, you cannot now with the uh, arrival of 5G, since the latency of 5G is promised to be below 10 milliseconds, you could in principle offload a lot of the computation, especially recognizance and mapping that are very energy hungry, to the cloud. That means a drone only does a very little thing. So still, of course, 90 to 80 percent of the power is needed to fly, so that you can only uh, save a little bit. But that's something that you can consider. Um, then the only issue will become, uh, OK, but uh, you know, we are relying on a cloud. How do you maintain connectivity with, uh, you know, within a building that is very far away from, uh, from uh, the base station? So th that can be done by creating like a network of drones. So like Dario was saying, you could, s you could send a swarm of drones, each one communicating with one another. And so this multi-hop communication can then ensure through a chain of drones uh, communication with the base station. So, that's one way also to see that. Of course, there is another last resort, which is a, a beaming energy. It's called uh, laser-powered energy. So there is a company called Laser Motive in California that uh, uh, has a huge um, laser <laughs> pointer, <laughs> this big, can transmit 100 watts. So a typical drone, like the ones we showed in our presentation, consumes 100 to 100 watts. So you can stream that up to several kilometers. Any bird flying in through that would be cooked almost instantaneously. That's the only problem. But it's already been used. Actually, there is a video from more than 10 years ago on YouTube where they did the 27 hours fly, autonomous flight inside a, a building you know, with this laser power technology to demonstrate that it's feasible. So it can be used, to, for example, to use drones to survey fires in California and other places, especially during hot times. Yeah, I think uh, you cover mo most of, of this. Just want to add a couple of things. One is related to what you said. Um, it, there is a lot of energy in the environment, and we can use that energy. So uh, if you look at birds that fly long distances, most of the time they just use uh, thermals or they use wind gusts. And um, that requires, however, information about wind speed that we today we cannot yet get from the uh, pitot tube, these air speed uh, sensors that we have on board. So that's a research line, for example, that we are, we and other people are, are currently pursuing how to make this long range flight. Um, the other thing is energy harvesting. Actually, in, w in a project at the moment, uh, and, and David is also part of that, it's a European project. We are looking at, uh, at drones that can uh, um, uh, uh, land and grasp power cables, and they have a recharger on board, they stay in there. And then when they are recharged, they just take off and they fly again. So, and there is plenty of energy out there. So a problem is going to be a combination of all of these. I'm not expecting um, batteries to have the, like, the magic sol solution. All of a sudden, we, there is a breakthrough. But the combination of all of these, I think, is going to be fine. Another question from our audience. Yes, all the way up there. So <laughs> Um, you mentioned uh, that there are attempts to improve crash safety of drones. It's hard to imagine how this works for drones with rotors. Is it like uh, making the systems more redundant or adding a parachute or something? What are the, the possible ways to improve this? Parachute is the first thing, and actually many drones already have, but uh, it occupies a large space, so you need a large drone, which means it's also, be, you know, uh, heavier and so more dangerous, of course. So the, the company that is operating uh, in, uh, in Switzerland for the Swiss Post actually uses parachutes and uh, it's deployed uh, when, uh, when uh, there was, a, was deployed when there was a crash. Uh, however, for example, the second crash, uh, uh, what happened is that the parachute was deployed in a, in a situation where it should not, not have been deployed. And then it got tangled with the rotors and then uh, it, it went down. So in this case, when a drone goes down, I would say the only possibility is to open an airbag, for example. But I would say that these are very rare, rare, rare scenarios, okay? So we are still observing the technology in order to learn and how to mitigate this. Um, the other thing is um, how to prevent them from crashing. So actually, you don't need to have uh, four quadrotors. So a quadrotor doesn't need to have all the four propellers operating to remain in flight. So there are already control algorithms that have been demonstrated more than five years ago in, in the research community, and there some of them have been sold already out there, that allow you to remain in flight with only three propellers. 
Now the chances that two propellers fail is really, you know, very, very small. So we care only about one propeller. But in general, a, a safe multicopter would be a, a one that has at least six propellers, because then if one fails or two fails, you always have the other four, and you can remain stable in flight. If you have a quadrocopter and one fails, the quadrotor starts uh, rotating, spinning on itself, uh, but you can still, uh, you know, uh, land uh, safely out there. Uh, however, what about GPS failure? So all the drones that commercially operate use GPS. GPS is blind. It's like navigating, you looking at Google Maps without looking around at the people around you, right? It makes no sense. But this is okay, it's allowed because there are no many drones out there. But the moment there will be many drones and, and you know, and you are navigating cluttered environments, cities, then you will need uh, also obstacle avoidance detection and so on. So these things, uh, is, they will come, it's just a matter of time. Thank you. That's completely covered uh, the, your answer. There is, we, d we do some experimental work making drones soft. <laughs> and actually, there is a small exhibition behind this, this wall. You can see some of our early prototypes. So the idea is that you have drones that when they fall, they are like sponges, they, be they can absorb the collision. They don't mitigate it entirely, but they don't, for example, make a punch <laughs> in somebody's skull. Uh, but, but this is, again, uh, research, so probably uh, will take some more activity to make it uh, a product. So interesting, thank you. Uh, wh wh uh, sorry. <laughs> well, one thing I, I, I want to add is uh, I, I think we also have uh, to change a little big, the, bit uh, the, the perception of drones because uh, when you go outside and there are cars driving, they're much more dangerous than any drone. Um, so maybe it's, it's, it's also a bit, uh, maybe public education. Uh, what can a drone, what, what can happen? I mean, usually drones don't fly over your heads. Uh, they fly over a field or uh, maybe over a street. Um, but if two cars crash into each other, it will be worse than a drone crashing into a car, probably. So, but of course, I mean, yeah, research needs to be done, as always. Okay, okay there's one more question over there. Thank you. Uh, I have a question actually on a related topic, uh, and it's about noise and public uh, public acceptance. So actually in the sky there are already millions of publicly accepted and very silent objects, right? Th these are birds. And the question is, do you think that certain biological inspiration or similarity would lead to, let's say, better, I don't know, noise rates and public acceptance? Because even if you look at the spot robot, for instance, the, the walking uh, autonomous robot, right? Uh, this like dog, dog inspired shape, I think it plays a uh, certain role in being it more, yeah, accepted by public compared to let's say wheeled mobile robots. And yeah, I'm fascinated by these uh, very dynamic uh, bird inspired designs that uh, Dario, you were showing. And uh, yeah, the second half of the question, do you think that will also help with uh, yeah, reducing the noise and uh, increasing the payload for uh, for the <coughs> for the drones. Thank you. Yeah. So for indeed for for these um, feather morphing drones, uh, they, they are relatively silent. We use just one propeller. We still use one propeller for because of research questions. So we, we are studying the, the role of morphing in agile maneuvers. And so I asked my students to not flapping the wings as well because that com from a research perspective, we change one variable at a time. Uh, but we are already studying the possibility of flapping the wings. And uh, there are some companies that make flapping wing drones. Um, there is a Dutch company, for example, using these drones for uh, scaring birds away from airports. And th they are relatively silent indeed. And as uh, David was mentioning earlier on, these drones also allow you to, to glide a lot of, lot of time. There is a lot of research still to be done to make them lightweight, to approximate the, um, the lightness of feathers and also the sensitivity that feathers in birds have. They have neuromuscular um, uh, sensors that allow them to judge uh, local turbulences, which they we do not have in drones. So they will rely on this inertial measurement unit, which is sitting in the central part of, of the drone. So, so yeah, there is a lot of research and probably there will be mitigation in noise as well. Thank you. That was a great question. Is there another burning question? Yes, please. 
Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, really interesting to see all this presentation. It's really exciting. And I have a question a bit abo uh, about the outlook, because you said like the goal is to achieve like uh, a five level of the autonomous. And uh, I was curious about that um, drone, uh, which was made like by inspired based on the bird. And as far as I understand, like the five, five, five uh, level number five, uh, reduce the human impact. And I'm curious about the prop, like proprioception, the, um, the type of the proprioception, because like if you look for the birds, there is, uh, they solve this solution. And I'm curious about if you will continue to use the video tracing, or it will be possible to mimic some kind of bird sensing. Okay, so maybe here I think both of us can answer this question. It's, it's, it's a very good one because it's what, what we're working on. We are working on um, artificial feathers that have proprioceptive information and are distributed throughout the body of these drones. So this is still a very early research question that we are uh, exploring in the lab. At the same time, as you have, imagine that we succeed, uh, you have all this information that comes from, from these feathers, which we know still relatively little about how birds integrate all these signals and uh, fuse this with, with visual information. That's where we have collaboration with David. We have a PhD student, actually, who is uh, starting to work on this and applying some of the methods that David showed for his quadrotors uh, to learn how to fly with these bird-inspired drones. Simon, would you like to add? No, you just took the microphone. Okay, well, with regards to the time, one very, very quick, quick, quick last round. Um, so you've shown uh, the last slide of your presentation was this overview of all the companies in Switzerland. There are so many. What makes Switzerland actually this really good place? What would you say? Um, it doesn't have to be you, maybe David or whoever wants to answer this question as well. Um, what makes Switzerland such a, such a great place for this uh, drone companies? Why, why are there so many in Switzerland? <laughs> <laughs> you answer for it. <laughs> I don't mind. Well, I, I, uh, I, I think I mentioned it. So th there is a very nice research environment. So uh, the research is really good, and there is a tradition of micro technology uh, that exists, uh, this tradition in Switzerland. And I think uh, much of the early prototypes that eventually turn into companies owes, owe to this type of uh, expertise. Um, there is also a program in artificial intelligence that started back in the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, that brought neural networks and a lot of uh, development in computer vision to Switzerland uh, that also left, um, uh, that helped this development. There is the Office of Federal Aviation that allows us to, to fly and do things that probably in other countries would not be able to fly. And, um, and then uh, I think we have also the National Research Program. It's a 12-year program that the Swiss Confederation gave us in total with the local universities, it's almost 100 million uh, Swiss francs uh, to do research uh, and technology transfer and education and equal opportunity, many things, but allows us to, uh, and it's only a small fraction of the funding that we have because we all f get funding from many different sources. But that program allows us to, to come together and to work together, and that's, that's quite important. And then there is a lot of... Um, Innovation, <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, which is about uh, entrepreneurship spirit in Switzerland, which is very pragmatic. Let's move on. Let's do something that has an impact. Yeah, and Davide, do we have the right uh, people? Are there maybe that's also this entrepreneurial spirit? Is that also one of yeah, the exactly? That's what I wanted to add. We have excellent schools uh, in Switzerland. We have EPFL, the University of Zurich, ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, we have Itzia and Lugano, which is. Uh, which has uh, invented the LS LSTM uh, that are basically used in all smartphones today to process our speech. So there is uh, all of this technology that's been there for, for more than a decade. We also have a very large uh, concentration of robotics professors, I think, normalized by the, uh, the country's population. Uh, yes, students are good, but also I would say that uh, some uh, Swiss um, academics were also the first to, for example, have uh, flying robots. Uh, Professor Sigvart uh, initially at the PFL demonstrated 20 years ago the first autonomous quadrotors uh, flying only up, up about uh, half a meter at that time. And then uh, a few years later, they built a, a coaxial helicopter that inspired the ingenuity helicopter that went to Mars. So 
there, were all, there was always a little bit of aerial soul into, into the Swiss universities, but then uh, certainly what, uh, what uh, helped was uh, especially the, the old legislation, so the fact that basically it's much easier to get these things out in the air than in other countries. And I come from Italy, a country where basically, you know, drones were very difficult to fly. I hear from all my colleagues and, you know, they couldn't believe what, they were tell what I was telling them at the time. They could fly them freely and test them. Definitely. Something. If I may add yes. just one yeah. sentence, I think the key is uh, the collaborative approach. Really, uh, I mean, the industry, the yeah. research institute, and also the government. And uh, I mean, now we have a cluster. I mean, you show it, uh, Dario, in his presentation at the end, the, the, the drone map. I mean, this cluster came, I mean, all those, those okay, of course, there are startups, spin off from ETH, from APFL, and so on, but also, also a, a lot of foreign companies, they came because they knew, okay, there is this kind of like ecosystem, so we want to be part of it. Mm. So, and, and for me, it's really this collaborative approach that is key uh, to everything. Yeah. Because I mean, the regulator, we are not innovative, so we, but we, we can listen. We can listen to to what they do. We can listen to what the industry needs, and then we can help them. And yeah. yeah. And understand yeah, the technology exactly. as well. So working together hand in hand, all the bodies. What about Germany? Would you say things are being pushed in the right direction? What's your, your future wish for okay. your industry? So I, I might want to add first uh, that it's exactly what I think um, that makes Switzerland special, that the collaboration between regulators, between universities and the industry works. It's It's a little bit closer to the industry, but it's not so far away that you would say, okay, there's no research done. You do proper research, but with a good focus on, on industry. Um, I'm, I know that in Germany for a fact it's also happening. Yes, uh, we have very good institutions uh, doing this technology transfer. Uh, but not yet as specialized, uh, as you mentioned, you have so many professors for uh, autonomous uh, robots or um, yeah, for, for this field um, that it's, it's clearly pushing in a certain direction, which of course helps. And it would help to have this in Germany as well, of course. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I would say let's continue this conversation having a glass of wine in our hands. Uh, I would like to say thank you so much uh, for this great contribution. I've learned a lot. I hope you feel the same and it's been interesting for you as well. So please give a very big applause to our speakers. Thanks.